Yeah, there's more on the table. I didn't know how, much, how many to make, but my printer ran out of ink. <laughs> so I'm glad that there is enough. Uh, my name is Frank, and 13 years ago, I wanted to end my life. I didn't want to live anymore. And I was very broken and lost and hurt and angry and all the above. And if it wasn't for prison ministry and brothers like Dwight and the volunteers that come up into the prison system, I don't think that me or Keith would be sitting here right now. I really believe that. And I was asked by Dwight to speak on the importance of prison ministry briefly. And I was praying last night and asking the Lord, like how I, th I wanted to just put a little outline together and, and this is put on my heart. But using this word help as an acronym, these are things that to me make it so important for churches to be involved in prison ministry. Because number one, the letter H, healing from past hurts, and everything I talk about here, I've experienced. And these were important for me. And I know that a lot of prisoners, I, was, I don't want to say all, but many prisoners have these things in common. A lot of us in prisons put on an outward facade that we're strong and it's a pretty scary place where you gotta you want to protect yourself and, and it's, it's not a safe environment. But deep, deep down inside of us, we're just, we're hurt human beings. And myself, I medicated that hurt through drugs and alcohol. And drugs and alcohol controlled my life and I made a lot of bad decisions under the influence of drugs. A lot of men in prison are the same. They're hurting, there's shame, there's guilt, there's fear, and all those things that a lot of times are never dealt with while they're in prison. And what happens is they leave the prison with that same hurt and the same shame and the same fear. And the solution is Jesus Christ, that people need to know Christ and people need to be transformed. And that's where prison ministry plays a big part Prison ministry coming into the prisons offers a safe place for guys to meet to where they could actually open up and, and share these hurts. And I think that healing can only take place if the things that are on the inside come out and they're exposed. Prison is not a safe place, but these Bible studies and the places that Brother Dwight and the ministries that come in, they offer a safe place for us to be able to share some of our pains and hurts so the healing can take place. And a lot of men in prison have trust, huge trust issues. So speaking to another inmate about these things are not very common. But these men that come into the prisons, we develop relationships with them. And like Brother Dwight, I, I can tell Brother Dwight anything because I know he cares about me and I know he loves me. So that's healing from past hurts. The next thing, prison ministry is important because of the letter E. Inmates need to be educated in the Word of God. And I used to love listening to Brother Dwight. I was excited that when Brother Dwight would come in because of his, he's just an awesome teacher. And I used to love listening to him, especially with the Old Testament. And he can break down the Old Testament and his, I could just sit there for hours and listen to him. But the Word of God changes people's lives. The Word of God changed my life. 
And I spent a lot of hours studying the Word of God, and, and the Word of God is living and it is powerful, and it does transform a person's life, and I can testify to that. Inmates will listen to Brother Dwight with more open ears than they would listen to Mayor Keith. <laughs> Because we're all wearing brown outfits. Like, who are you? <laughs> so I love to teach the Bible, and you know, I got the opportunity to do that in prison. But something about somebody from the outside coming in, people's ears open up a little bit more. Because you know, Brother Dwight knows what he's talking about. I don't. So <laughs> the word of God is still living and powerful no matter what mouth is coming out of, right? Amen. Uh, inmates are more likely to get involved in Bible studies when the volunteers are coming in. If I'm holding a Bible study on the block, you know, you might get a couple guys to show up. But these ministries that come up to the prisons, people sign up to them. I mean, we, we have pretty big numbers, right? Keith, in these Bible studies and Yoke Fellowship and Life Ministries. So there's, a, there's an opportunity where People want to get off their block, they want to get away from all the noise, and they, they show up at these Bible studies that the volunteers bring in, and there's an opportunity to present Jesus Christ and the Word of God to them. So they need to be educated in the Word of God. The third one is leading by example. There's not a lot of godly examples of Christian men in prison. There's a lot lesser number in the prison that are faithfully walking the walk than there are that shows up on Sunday morning at the church service. And I would say I met a handful of guys. Keith's one of them. Keith was on fire when we were in there. Me and him used to walk the yard and, and talk about Christ and our walk and what we're going to do when we get out. And it's just amazing what God has been doing in both of our lives. We're walking the prison yard, dreaming about what would life be like outside of prison, but really not being able to grasp that because it's hard when you're in there. And it's hard to keep thinking about the day that you get out because it's so far away. And not only are we both out, but we both work at the same place. God blessed us to live in Belleville in a, a beautiful environment. We have beautiful people in our life. We work on the same machine. We both got promoted the same day. And we only, <laughs> he can see my house from his window. And just, God kept us together. And, and it's just, that's another like testimony. It's very powerful to think how God just brought us together and how he kept us together. And because there's, there's strength in that, having another brother alongside you. Yeah. But leading by example is these guys that will come in, like Brother Dwight and Brother Luke and, and all these volunteers. I was actually being able to see what a Christian man really looks like. And it was through the consistency of coming in every week and the love. And, and you just knew that they loved you and they cared about you. And that, I mean, that's huge to have that for uh, prisoners that are sitting in the prison. And the last one is P. Prison ministry helps prisoners to prepare for their future release. And like I said, a lot of times, if it wasn't for prison ministry, guys would come into the prison and most of the time probably leave the prison the same person they was when they came in. And that's not good for them and it's not good for the community that they're getting released into. So prison ministry helps with that. For me and Keith, prison ministry was through Brother Luke and Yo Fellowship that I asked, we, well both of us got introduced to Stepping Stones and that's where me and Keith both paroled to. And it was a blessing from God to give us that foundation when we, when we came out of the prison. After being in that kind of environment for 13 years, it's hard 
to adjust into regular uh, society. And these men are still helping me today to do that. A safer environment, how to plan for the future, accountability. I have a lot of guys that, and this, and this is a blessing too, because I used to sit in the chapel and think, man, what would it be like with Brother Luke? Yeah, any of you guys know Brother Luke Martin? No, oh, okay. So he's one of the volunteers, but <laughs> he, his famous saying, he's coming back, brothers. And I used to be like thinking, what would it be like to fellowship with Brother Luke on the outside? I never thought in a million years that I would actually see Dwight again after I left the prison or Brother Luke or any of these guys. And these guys are actually in my life right now. And the whole time, like, God was listening to everything. <laughs> everything that I was crying in my heart. Like, God was listening to all that. And the things that I never thought was possible, God made possible. And, and if it wasn't for these guys in my life right now to hold me accountable and you know, if I was back in Pittsburgh, I don't, I don't know, like, where my life would be or where my life would be heading right now. But God's got me in the right place and the right people around me. But it was through prison ministry that all this happened. And Jesus, at the sheep and goat judgment, he says, when, you know, when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. He said, when I was in prison, you visited me. And they said, when did we do that? He said, when you did it to any of the least of my brethren, you did it unto me. So I think it's very important that us as Christians on the outside of the prison have a heart and compassion for those that are behind those walls. Enough that where you can leave your comfort zone and actually go beyond those walls to the inside to meet some of the guys in there because it's very important because when we're doing that for them we're actually doing it for Jesus and there's one last scripture I want to leave you with and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 27 and 29 and he told me to this last night but it says but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Ye and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And this is why, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So I just want to say that beyond those prison walls where you can't see from here sitting in this room but beyond those walls are chosen vessels by God weak and despised men that God chose but just like Paul was a chosen vessel and God came to him in a revelation he still sent Ananias to Straight Street, to lay his hands on Paul to receive his sight. So I'm hoping that God is pricking somebody's heart to be that next messenger that's going to be sent beyond those walls to some of God's chosen jewels and precious stones inside those prisons. Because you never know who you're going to share Jesus with and what God's going to do and impact the world through those people. So I appreciate you guys letting me come and share and invite me. And, and you guys are some pretty down-to-earth people. <laughs> especially Frank. Yeah, especially <laughs> Frank. Right we, share, we share the same name. We're proud of them. They have low expectations. But I want you to know that I felt very comfortable here, and I appreciate that. So thanks. Frank, uh, can we, can we ask a couple questions? Yeah, yeah. Robert, go ahead. Uh, how do guys get Bibles in the prison? Does it have to come from the publisher? So there is a lot of Bibles in prisons. 
and people have access to them. So they go through their chaplain. If anybody wants a Bible in prison, they can get a Bible. Mm. And there's a lot of Bibles being sent in. There's a lot of Bibles sitting on the shelves. There's a lot of Bibles sitting underneath people's TVs to hold their TVs up. Yep. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> but the word, the word of God is in there. It's just the environment. When you go into a prison, there's unwritten rules. And it's not a safe environment. And a lot of people in prison hide. And some of them hide in church. But the gospel of Jesus Christ has power. And I believe that even people hiding in the church still hear the same gospel that saves. And but the word of God is there. It's it's the guys that come into the prison, the, the, the volunteers. We were blessed at Rockview. We had a lot of Bible studies, a lot of volunteers coming in. And we were constantly being ministered to until COVID. I was there for a whole year during COVID when the whole prison was shut down. And I happened to be on a block with no Christians. <laughs> so that wasn't fun. But the guys are extremely like missing, you know, the volunteers and, and the volunteers are I'm sure grieving Brother Luke is that he can't get in. And they just started the church services back up, but they're doing it in little small groups. But yeah, they do have the Bible. There's plenty of Bibles. Are there, are there other uh, faiths that provide similar sort of studies? Like, I'm wondering, are, are the Muslims in there running studies on the Quran? Yeah. Yeah, so there's competitors, in other words, for the true Word of God yeah. and for men's hearts. There, there, there's a lot of... There's a lot of teachings and beliefs and religions in the prison. Yeah. And they're not shy, the Muslims, they're not shy to go to the Christians and try to lure them away from Christ. Yeah, I'm sure. And I wish the, uh, the Christians were a little bit less shy in winning people over to Christ. But there are a lot of false religions in there. And there are some in the church. The one is Pentecostalism, is guys that I battled with a lot, luring people away from the real Christ of the Bible. But yeah, it's a challenge. I, ha I actually have two questions. Uh, did you ever think you would stand in front of people and speak? And, <laughs> and my, my next one is, um, I don't, you may not even know the statistics of this, but of how many men don't know how to read? Yes. So no, I didn't think I was going <laughs> to, especially if Brother Dwight's in his presence, he's speaking. And uh, there's a lot of people in prison that can't read or write. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the younger generation is growing up now. It's just getting worse and worse. And prison's full of young people now. Yeah, our schools are not doing their job. Yeah, they, they weren't taught respect, they weren't taught, they don't have direction, and they're being taken advantage of by the older gang members and stuff like that to do their dirty work. But yeah, I met a lot of people who couldn't read or write, and a lot of them won't admit it. But Is, are there any organizations going in that you know of to, to uh, teach inmates reading? Well, if they want to learn, they're there is an educational program okay. in prison. But COVID, I mean, COVID changed everything. I mean, there, there was absolutely nothing. You were stuck on your block and in your cell mm -hmm. almost like 24 hours a day. Yeah, but they do normally have education programs. If you don't have your GED, I think, don't they force you kind of like take classes? Yeah, if you don't have it. If you want a job in the prison. Yeah. Or else they'll cancel your work privileges and uh, things like that. Oh, that's good. And one of these days, maybe you hear uh, well, our real testimonies, but Keith has a powerful testimony, too. We got time, yeah. Keith, if you want. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you already know we have low expectations, Frank's here. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, tell, tell us what a day looked like at Rockview. Uh, when did you get up? How structured was your day? Tell us about the structure. Mine personally? Yeah, the structure of, a, of an average day at Rockview. Yes. So I would wake up around 4.35 in the morning. I got used to that. Now I work night shift and it's hard. <laughs> I, I still want to wake up early. My, my body automatically wakes up too early. And I don't get enough sleep. But I would wake up at 5 in the morning around there and spend one or two hours with the Lord. And that was my thing. In the morning is the only time that the prison is quiet. <laughs> That's the, that is the only time. So I got used to waking up early. And I, I used to listen to like 88.9 uh, Way Truth Life Radio. I listened to the worship music and, and, I, and I studied. And, uh, and that, was, that was beautiful that I was able to spend that time. I'm trying to discipline myself to, you know, continue to do that, but I find myself being really distracted, you know, so I'm trying to discipline myself to do that. And after that, there was breakfast, and then sometimes there was yard. I worked. Most of the time that I was in prison, I was either running groups, working in the drug and alcohol program. I did HVAC for a little bit, teaching guys in the school. I did that for like four or five years. But I had a role as a teacher, running groups and everything like that for most of the time. And I studied. We studied a lot in ourselves and I would Go to the Bible studies. There was Bible studies, I think, every day, right? Except for one during the week. I yeah. Know. I try to work out for an hour a day, whether that was in the yard or at they have a weight room. And not much. <laughs> there's not there's not much. I did spend a lot of time in the Word of God. And that's one of the that's one of the blessings of our prison is the time that you have to spend with the Lord. You know, I didn't waste time playing cards and chess and all that stuff. Very little did I do that. And, uh, and I thank God for that, though. Because I could have got out of prison a better pinochle player. <laughs> I used to say that to guys, like, man, you're going to leave prison and be able to... Be a better chess player, man, but what are you doing with your life? <laughs> I always tell guys working out, too, I said, man, you can lift you can lift the truck by the time you leave here. I said, but Samson was strong, too. But when it came to Delilah, he was very weak. I said, so you need to work on that spiritual side of you. I used to tell guys that all the time. Any other questions? Frank, um... You talked about the safe, the safe haven, so to speak, uh, of coming to chapel when Bible studies are there. Were you there the night when Keith Thomas uh, opened up and shared his testimony the first time? Do you know Keith Thomas? Keith, the little, little skinny black guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you Keith, there the yeah. night when he shared and opened up and told his life story? Were you there? That Some hard night? stuff he told. Some hard stuff yeah. he told. And uh, do you remember the change that, that happened over the yep. next week or two weeks I did. in his life? That was amazing. Yeah, because he was in tears when he shared it. Exactly. And yeah. that's, there's, a, there's power in confession. He says, confess your sins, sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The word healing isn't in 1 John 1 9. Because I believe that guilt. When I confess my sins to God, He forgives my guilt. Amen. But when I confess my sins to one another, it heals me of my shame. Because I can know that God forgave me and still not have any relationships with other people. Because guilt is saying that I made a mistake and shame says I am a mistake. Mm -hmm. And God knows that there's power in confessing where Satan controls a lot of us from our secrets, from that secret place because he's a prince of darkness. 
But yeah, I watched this guy share his testimony in, in tears, and he was set free. And you can see that he was healed. Frank, um, I remember I remember being there at Rockview and sharing uh, Isaiah 40, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak comfortably with them, because they, they have received double for all their, for all their guilt and oh, yeah, all their shame. Um, as I remember you specifically coming to me later and uh, talking about what you just talked about, and that God doesn't just want to forgive us of what we did wrong, but he wants to, wants to heal us and wants to, wants to help us to overcome the things that are shameful in our lives. Do you care to say anything more about that? Yeah, it's just, this is just my understanding. And I got like this illustration. I'm driving down the street and I get into a little fender bender. And I take the car, car to the garage and you know, he looks at it, it's a little dent. An hour later, I'm back in my car. He pulls the dent out. Took an hour to fix that. God found me in the junkyard. So when you go all the way back in the junkyard and that car is smashed into that block and it's getting ready to get lit on fire and melted down, that's where God found me. There was a lot more dents in my life that God needed to pull out. And I'm still healing from a lot of things that happened to me in the past. <clears throat> but I really believe that there are so many men, especially in the prisons, that are so hurt and carrying around so much shame and unforgiveness and anger and all those things. I believe that when I'm saved, God took my stony heart and he gave me a heart of flesh. But do you notice that our mind has to be renewed? I don't think God gave me a new brain because my brain is still messed up. And the Word of God is renewing my thinking to think like Jesus. And there are a lot of things I believe that I needed to be healed from in my past, the hurt and the trauma and things like that, to where sometimes we can tell a person, hey, you're, you know, you're saved and you got Christ. And you just need to go forward. But my personal belief is there's a time that you need to go back and you need to deal with some of the things in the past so that God can heal you. And it's deliverance ministry. And, and I believe it's very important that, no, you don't harp on the past or you don't stay back there. You know, you keep your eyes on Jesus. But there is some hurt and some pain, I believe, that we can carry to the cross when we meet Jesus and we can continue into our life with Christ still carrying that baggage with us. And I think that's why a lot of Christians continue to walk in defeat. How, how do you, I'm trying to find a nice way to put this, how do you deal with people that you knew before you went to prison who are now still out and given your conversion to Christ but they're the same way? Is there some, do you distance yourself? Do you just cut those relations? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I struggle with it because a lot of my family, I distance myself. And I have a daughter in Pittsburgh and she tried at one point pulling me back to Pittsburgh and I want to have a relationship with her. But she got so much drama in her life and I don't, I don't know how to, balance that all, all the time. But as far as my mother, my brother, my brother's on drugs. and I mean, I cut everybody off from my past. Like anybody that was involved in my past besides family, they're not in my life anymore. I don't feel comfortable around people that are living the lifestyle that I used to live. I feel safe and comfortable around brothers and sisters in Christ that are living their life for Jesus. And sometimes I walk on pins and needles because I don't want to go back to prison. And I know that I could be influenced. I know that I have weaknesses. I know that I could be pulled in the wrong direction. And Satan is very crafty in his method to do that. He's generational. He's not only trying to kill me, he's trying to kill my grandson. He's trying to kill his grandson. And I believe, I tell Keith this all the time, that it's a 
It's a process away from God. It's not a decision I make. It's a process of small compromises, bad choices and decisions. And, and I don't want to go down that path. So I, I try to keep myself safe by staying away from a lot of people. But I don't know how to balance it yet. You know, my daughter's mad at me now. <laughs> she, th- she says, you think you're perfect? I said, no, I'm not perfect. But it's just my, my light is shining on my daughter's life. And it's causing her to feel guilty. So I can't give her advice. I can't talk to her about anything. You know, I just try to love her the best that I can. And I just don't know how to do that all the time. Yeah, she's mad at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? She'll get over it. I just want to make a comment. You know, you're not the only one. You came out of prison, but there's those of us out here who had to cut ourselves off from people too after we were saved. So it's it's a struggle for more than just those who've been in prison. Maybe it might, maybe it's not as large as yours, but there's still people we have to cut us and family mainly was family members because I didn't feel safe around. Them. So yeah. like, okay, I'm just not gonna go see you anymore. And I have a huge like. Fear of rejection. Like I've dealt with that my whole childhood. It still affects me today. And, you know, God got to give me, just on the way here, speaking in front of you guys. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Like, I had to speak it out loud on the way here. And it's just, I, it's easier for me to tell people things than for me to actually, like, personalize it and accept it. But I used to tell guys all the time, like, look, if you're, if you're living for Christ, you don't have to worry about staying away from people. They'll stay away from you. Like, <laughs> yeah, God is going to wean out people that don't belong in your life if you're following Him. And you don't have to worry about rejection. Our Frank is rejected most of the time. You kind of like it. You never enjoyed it. Actually, on a more serious note, my wife and I were atheists, and you know what one of the definitions of an atheist is? Former Roman Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Very that's angry former Roman Catholics. Angry yeah. 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 That's yeah. a good one. When my wife and I came to Christ, there were half a dozen people I knew who, when I told them I'd come to Jesus, that was it. And at first I thought, well, what, what, what? Uh, no, this is a good thing. I don't have to do all those things. <laughs> I don't have to deal with the, with all the shenanigans. And I felt good being rejected if it was for the reason of being with Christ. Yeah. And my attitude was, I'm Frank's wife, my attitude was, yeah, I guess if I'm sharing the gospel with someone and they're getting really angry at me and getting lathered up, I'm doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm reaching into some button of theirs that needed to be pushed. So I, it yeah. actually can be a, an encouragement in an odd way. I mean, it's hard to have friends and family turn their backs on you, but, but yeah, it, it can actually mean yeah, you're probably standing for the truth and they don't want to hear it. So yeah, yeah just keep loving them and, and doing the best you can, but it's not easy all the time. Yeah, I always say that when Peter preached his sermon, when he preached the gospel, either they're going to get saved or they're going to get angry. <laughs> Because, you know, they responded to Peter's message, but when Stephen preached almost the same sermon, they, you know, they stoned him to death. They were both pricked. All right, their, their hearts were pricked. That's what the gospel does. How they respond. And it's easy to say that. <laughs> but I struggle with that. That's not so much fun when it happens. But we all have struggles, you know, from our past that we're dealing with. Even people that were born in Christ, into Christian families and, and accepted Jesus. You always have something that you're dealing with. And sometimes it's safe just to turn around and run. Now, I can't run that fast anymore. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I've had to do that my whole life. Just you know, turn around and you run away. You know, because it's not, you, maybe you don't have the strength to deal with it. Yeah. I was afraid when I was, there were times that I was afraid when I was leaving prison. I want to be a part of a church family so bad because I know I've already turned away from my earthly family. 
And I was so afraid that I was going to be rejected by church members. Just and send them to me. I'll straighten them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I was afraid of that. and Because uh, I don't know what I would do if that happened. And I, I believe that God put me in a place where, I mean, the people that I have in my life, they don't even they don't even care to know why you were in prison, where you came from, what you did in the past, and that that's like that's the first time I've ever like actually witnessed like real Christians because in prison it's like even uh, Islam I call it prison law because it, I don't think there's a lot of true believers they're just it's the outward, you know, Paul warns about those that have a form of godliness but deny the power. There's no power. It's just a form of godliness. And I just appreciate you guys, again, for being so uh, comforting. Well, we appreciate you coming. Oh, yeah. oh, both of you. I mean, it's a wonderful ministry to us to have you here, so thank you. And Keith don't like to drive far, and he followed me all the way here. <laughs> That's a good brother. That's a good brother. <laughs>